Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my first look at the brand new Camlan 50mm f1.1, and this is the Mark II. Now, going back to October of 2017, I did a review of the first generation of this lens. I, at that point, my kind of final analysis was is that I considered it really to be a little bit more of a novelty than a serious lens. It produced really nice bokeh quality, but at the same time, I found that the lens was so soft in a lot of ways that I just, and, and lacked contrast, particularly when you had any kind of bright light at all, that I just, I didn't consider it to be a real, a serious, a serious lens, essentially. I, more of a novelty, as I said, but I found that when I reviewed the 28 millimeter f1.4, a lens that I actually really like and I use quite often for video work and you know sometimes just for a small prime, I actually found it to be uh, a huge improvement and really liked the uh, contrast from the lens, the color rendition, the bokeh quality. And so when Camlan began to tell me you know, late last year in 2018 that they had a Mark II version of this lens coming. And then I began to see the specs for it. I realized that they were building a completely different kind of lens. This lens is, it's physically larger. It's nearly twice as heavy. It's got a lot more elements in it. Uh, it is a much more serious optical instrument. And so as we're going to see, we're gonna take a closer look at what you're getting, the build and handling, and checking out this lens. I've got it here both in a Fuji and a Sony APS-C E-mount. So let's jump in and let's take a closer look at the lens and see what you're actually getting for your money. Let's take a look. All right, so let's take a closer look at the new 50 millimeter f1.1 Mark II from Camlam. So you can see here, I've actually got it in both a Sony and a Fuji mount. I've had the Fuji mount since early on in the year, um, January, and then the Sony for the last uh, month or so. And so uh, what you can see here is that while this is still a really nicely compact lens, it certainly has grown significantly from the Mark I which of course, I, as I've already noted, I think is a good thing. This is a real lens, not kind of a novelty like the Mark I was to me. So there's definitely a, basically everything that's changed um, in terms of the optical design and the size. What has stayed the same is that you've still got a manual focus lens and you've still got a manual aperture ring. The manual aperture ring is still among the shortcomings here in that the manual focus ring is Beautiful. I mean, it's beautifully damped on both of these copies. It just moves really smooth, really nicely, makes it a nice video lens. Unfortunately, the manual aperture ring, even though it's declicked, and, and so of course that, that helps. Um, the whole point of having a declipped aperture is being able to move it nice and smoothly. The Sony copy is not bad, as you can see. Unfortunately, after months of use, the Fuji copy is still quite stiff to where it requires far more effort than what I would like, particularly if you're trying to smoothly rack through that. And so, I mean, it does you know, kind of loosen up a little bit as you've used it, but it's not something lasting. The, the Sony copy, which is a newer copy, is better. And so I'm hoping that production models will be improved in this regard. Now, of course, this is a 50 millimeter lens. And so how that focal length plays out depends on your platform. In the case of Sony and Fuji, this is a 75 millimeter equivalent lens. If you're using it in a Canon EFM mount, that's a 1.6 times crop factor instead of the 1.5 of these two bodies. So with a 1.6 crop factor, that becomes an 80 millimeter full frame equivalent. And then if you're using it on micro four thirds, it becomes a 100 millimeter equivalent. So as I've noted, this lens has gotten quite a bit larger. Um, everything is still all metal as before, really, really nicely made. But because everything is so kind of densely made, this new lens in particular really has some heft to it. So it comes in, the first generation lens was 248 grams. This one comes in at a whopping 563 grams. And so it's, it's definitely a, a, a chunk of lens here. Everything really heavy grade metals into it. There is no weather sealing, but you see that there is a fixed rear element here. So there's less opportunity for dust to get in there. And of course there are no electronics. So the good news when it comes to sealing is that there is less to be damaged. The negative is, is that I would, and I really think this needs to be the next stage for Camlan, maybe not going to autofocus, but at least developing a, you know, aperture 
maybe aperture control or at the least electronic contacts to where communication can be put into the body. You know, for example, to help with EXIF information, to identify the lens, maybe the aperture, that would be nice. But even in the case of if you're using it on a body like the A6500, well, there's in-body image stabilization here, but because the lens, the camera doesn't know what lens is attached because there's no communication, you have to manually input like your steady shot. In this case, you know, I've you know, put in a manual value of 50 millimeters. So you do get stability, but it's not going to automatically detect that. So I certainly would like to see that. The lens has grown in every dimension here. The original lens was a tiny 60 by 60 millimeters. This new lens is 72 millimeters in diameter, and then it is 68 millimeters in length. And so it's not a lot longer, eight millimeters, but it's definitely grown in its girth. Now that's reflected by the fact that uh, with the 28 millimeter f1.4, uh, Camlam began to develop matching metal lens hoods. So the lens hoods here are actually really, really nice um, in terms. So they're they're a perfect match for the build materials. You can see that there's a finely ribbed interior. This is a much nicer than typical lens hood. However, it is a screw-in lens hood. So what that means is that if you are have no lens hood attached you are going to have a 62 millimeter front filter thread. However, if you're going to attach the lens hood, and this is a screw in, not bayonet style, so you screw it into place. Now it is threaded at the front and that filter size grows to 72 millimeters. Maybe not a bad thing actually, 62 millimeters is not a very common filter size. 72 millimeters is one that I've seen shared with a lot of other lenses. Now, as before, you have got a lot of glass here. We noted at the back of the lens, there's a lot of glass. If you look in the lens from the front, there is a lot of glass there, um, particularly for an APS-C type lens. So that, of course, contributes to the weight. It makes it much heavier because now you've got a lot, much, a lot more glass there. Um, you know, it was f1.1 before, but it was f1.1 without a whole lot of optical performance. In this case, you're actually getting the optical performance as well as what we're going to see. And so you've gone from a optical formula that was originally five elements in five groups to a much more complex nine elements in seven groups. So a, just as I said, a much more serious optical formula. Beyond that, they've even managed to shrink the minimum focus distance. Now, as you can see, as you move towards minimum focus, the lens barrel does extend out during focus about uh, you know, two centimeters roughly. In this case, before you had a 0 0.5 millimeter uh, minimum focus distance, that's now increased to a 0 0.4 or decreased, maybe I should say, it's decreased and thus the you know, resulting magnification does increase because you can focus down more closely. So they've made, uh, you know, improvements all the way around when it comes to that. As I've noted, beautiful, beautiful focus ring. I mean, it feels awful Zeiss-like. I wish the aperture ring was as Zeiss-like in its smoothness, but at least in the, the case of the Sony, it does loosen up a little bit, but it's still too heavy. This is actually a lot of lens, particularly considering the fact that they're still trying to keep the Kickstarter price at under $200 US. And so it certainly is going to be, for those that don't mind manual focus and really want the kind of the unique performance you can get out of such a wide aperture lens. Uh, this certainly will be an intriguing option for people when it hits the market. And so as you can see, as I noted in the intro, this is definitely a, a much more serious lens. How much more serious we'll see when we do the optical test here. And so stay tuned to that. That will be the next episode. I'll take a look at, at the, you know, the image quality from the lens and give you a verdict on it. But this is definitely for those of you that are interested in not just having, you know, you kind of like kind of dreamy bokeh images, but want serious performance for portraits, um, beautiful bokeh, but also nice sharpness and contrast. I think you'll be much more interested in this lens as we take a look at it. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, if you look in the description down below, you can find a number of images. I've been shooting with this on both Fuji and Sony for some time. And so I've got a pretty big variety of, of images there, everything from portraits to landscapes, general purpose stuff, you know, bokeh images. So take a look at that and maybe get a feel for what the lens 
can produce. You can also find uh, information there on how to uh, check out the Kickstarter campaign and uh, maybe get on board and get one of these ordered for yourself. You can also find typical linkage there to follow me on social media, including now on Instagram, to become a patron and get early previews of upcoming content. And of course, if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.